I can spend hours showing my family album to you and describing every one of the pictures there and telling the story behind it. Every picture in my album has uh, memories of a special time. And that's what pictures do. They capture images, they stir up our emotions, and they store our memories. The other day, somebody came to my office and looked at my wedding, one of my wedding pictures and made the comment out of here all the time. You look a little different, and especially up here. And I tell them, yeah, I used to have a different haircut 16 years ago. But then, and then comes the comment I always hear, and I agree uh, with which I agree, is your wife hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> and uh, that particular picture takes us back to 2002 when we got married, uh, and then when we were rookies at this marriage thing, and we were dreaming about starting a family and could uh, barely make end, ends meet, and uh, juggling church, work, and family, and all of that, and it's such a sweet time. And you, have, you do the same thing. When you go through your pictures, uh, you are reminded of um, your mom's cooking, or siblings and spending summers together, and siblings that are now in other parts of the country or, or other parts of the world. And then uh, looking at those pictures brings memories of somebody special, a family member, a treasured friend. And the old cliche holds true. Every picture is worth a thousand words. Today, God's going to show us one of his uh, uh, portraits, family portraits. And the picture is worth, to be exact, 144,000 words. We're going to be in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. And we're going to see those special people in God's uh, family. And I want you to imagine that you are sitting down next to God and his pointing you to, the, to his son and the 144,000 people in this picture here and, and, and telling you how special they are and uh, how they bring sweet memories to God because he transcends time. So what we're looking at is a picture in the future from our perspective. Uh, but to God, because God is outside of time, uh, it, it doesn't matter. It, it's a family portrait. So... Um, and it's an it's a interesting feature here in the book of Revelation because we're looking at a still image. Uh, there's no movement here, which is unusual because so far in the book of Revelation, we are used to seeing images, dialogue, color, songs, and uh, events, action, warfare, and all of that. But today, everything slows down and comes to a halt, and there's a purpose behind it. This is not in chronological order the picture that we're going to see here. So we can consider this a, a, a portrait in word format, in text format. And we're going to see as we take this picture apart like a puzzle and um, put the pieces back together, we're going to see what God has to say to us um, about his character and how he inspires us to live godly in the present age like uh, the book of Titus teaches us. But I, I want to invite you to do that this morning and look at this family portrait that belongs to God, and we're in the uh, 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. Open your Bibles to that portion, and I hope that you will be encouraged to live godly for him as we see uh, the example of some godly folks here that we're going to meet. So Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5, John says, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice uh, which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb, and no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. So here we are, God's family portrait here, and there are three basic elements in this picture. We're going to look at each one of them. Again, we're, what we're doing is we're going to take this apart as a puzzle and put them back together as we study and examine this picture in text format. The first basic element of this picture is the Son, S-O-N, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And I want you to hear the, uh, the relief in John's voice when he says, Behold the Lamb. Because remember, the, the uh, context of this picture is right after 
terrifying images that John saw in chapter 13. He's describing the Antichrist, the beast, the, 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 the false prophets. So he's describing dragons, bizarre and grotesque beasts, a, a giant woman standing on the moon. And it's hard for us to even picture these things. And then all of a sudden, the relief, oh, behold, the Lamb of God standing on Mount Zion. And, and, and I want you to, to share the same sense of relief here because, again, uh, there's a purpose behind this. This is a, a still image of the second coming of Christ. Again, this is not in chronological order because after this picture here, we're going to see more judgment. There, there, there are more terrifying scenes coming after this. And particularly in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, we'll see the same event but described in much more action terms, that there will be color, there will be action, there will be more sounds, and Jesus Christ coming back, and an army uh, of believers coming back with him. But here he sees Jesus Christ standing on Mount Zion. And uh, after the, the terrifying scenes of dragons, beasts, and persecution, and describing immorality, and sin, and judgment, oh, such a refreshing picture. Behold the Lamb of God standing on Mount Zion. Now, this is not a scene of heaven, and the reason we know this is because Jesus Christ is standing on Mount Zion, another word for Jerusalem, and uh, there are 144,000 people with him, and these are the folks we met in chapter 7 of the book of Revelation that God promised to preserve through this time, through the, the, the period of the tribulation. Now, if this uh, were a scene in heaven, these, this means these folks would have died and we were seeing them in resurrection form. This is not the case because God promised to keep them alive through the, uh, through the tribulation. In fact, let me take you to that passage. Uh, chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. And uh, the, 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 uh, actually, chapter 7, the verse 3 says this. They, uh, starting in verse 2, I saw another angel ascending from the rising sun, having the seal of the living God, and he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea and the trees until you have sealed the bond servants uh, of God on their uh, foreheads. And these are the folks that we meet here. But now go back to that image of God showing you his family portrait. And um, imagine that God is showing to you the picture of Jesus Christ and saying, this is my son, and today is the day I installed my king upon Mount Zion, my holy mountain. That's a reference to Psalm 2, verse 6. Or he may say, uh, that's the day I restored the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Because remember, the time of the tribulation, uh, the future tribulation, is the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of judgment here on the earth, and the second coming of Christ is when everything ends and he establishes his kingdom on the earth. But we still see Jesus Christ pictured as a lamb here. It's a symbolic image. Jesus Christ doesn't look like a lamb, but the lamb that we see here represents um, the gentleness of Jesus Christ. He is as gentle as a lamb and as majestic as a lion. There's a reason why we see him here standing upright. It's because he is seen in triumph ready to reign, ready to take back the possession that belongs to him. Remember, in chapter 5 of the book of Revelation, we met uh, Jesus Christ pictured as a lamb, and he has in his hand the title deed to the universe, what we're also calling the writ of possession, which means that the earth and the universe and everything belongs to him. He's ready to take everything back, and he's ready to kick out the squatter, Satan, who is temporarily, um, uh, ha has temporary control of... Uh, the universe and the earth. But again, this is only temporary. It's under divine authority, under divine control. And Jesus Christ stands tall, upright, and ready to take what belongs to him. And that's an, a still image. And we look forward to that image, too. Because Jesus Christ was the one who taught us to pray, Lord, your kingdom come. So every time we pray, Lord, your kingdom come, we're looking forward to this picture. We're looking forward to that moment when Jesus Christ comes back and take his possession. Uh, thankfully, we're not going to be here during the tribulation of the end times. We're not going to go through everything that we see here. If you're a believer in Christ, the promise is that you are going to be raptured before all of these things happen. But according to the book of Titus, we believers look forward to this moment because we uh, look forward to the time 
to the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, like T Titus says. And we have been longing for the return of Christ since the ascension of Jesus Christ, do we not? Because remember, right after the resurrection of Christ and he, when he was uh, commissioning his disciples to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Jerusalem, and Samaria, and all the ends of the earth, right after this, uh, he was taken up to heaven, and then a couple angels came to the disciples and said this, Men of Galilee, this is in Acts 1, verse 11. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you watch them go into heaven. And here we are seeing the picture of that moment. Jesus Christ already on the earth, ready to reign supreme, standing upright, sovereign over the affairs of the universe. And in this family portrait, we also imagine God the Father saying, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. So our eyes are directed to the Son of God, Jesus Christ, standing upright in the picture of a lamb, reigning supreme. And what a great way to, to uh, go through trials. Because remember, the original readers of the book of Revelation were the seven churches of Asia Minor. Chapters 1 through 3, uh, they were the seven churches of Asia Minor facing persecution, being persecuted for their faith, some of them being killed. And John also looking at all of this in the island of Patmos, being banished for his faith. For, for his faith. And they are, well, this must have been such a relief. And that's not a bad way to go through trials and tribulation. Just imagine, look, look at this picture. Read the book of Revelation and imagine Jesus Christ standing tall, uh, sovereign, and ready to take over uh, what belongs to him. He, he's got you covered because he controls the, the affairs of the universe. Therefore, obviously, he controls the affairs of your life. Nothing that happens to you escapes the control of a sovereign God. So this is a, a snapshot of the second coming of Christ. And what does that teach us about the character and the attributes of God? First of all, it teaches about the faithfulness of God because this is all, uh, these are all promises that he made. He promised this, uh, the, that his son was going to come back one day and take over the earth. And he demonstrates that faithfulness by keeping his promises. And also, uh, we, we are reminded of his uh, goodness and kindness because he's raising up a group of people to be witnesses of Christ during that time which are the servants that we met here so the first element of the picture that we're looking at uh, is the son of God or the the, the son the S-O-N and now let's look at the servants in verses 1 verse uh, 4 and verse 5 and let's be inspired to live uh, for him again consider the context of this picture the group of people we met last week or the last few uh, Sundays were the followers of the Antichrist, the, the people who will follow Satan, people who will uh, abandon God and they will blaspheme God. And the, John calls them the, the inhabitants of the earth. And, and uh, you may be discouraged just by reading about them and then saying, well, there, there are, there, are there no one that, are, that is following Jesus Christ? Now, the contrast. Look at the, the bond servants of God. And they are named the bond servants. Look again in verse 7, chapter 3. These are the bond servants of God. And they have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they are the 12,000 from each tribe of, uh, of Israel. And they will, they will follow Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> We first met them in chapter 7 in the storyline here. This is apocalyptic. This is in the future. We first met them in chapter 7 when they are getting ready and they're being prepared to endure the tribulation. God is prepared to save them, to, to keep them alive during this time. And here we meet them after the second coming of Christ. And there are three particular elements of their uh, uh, ministry here that I point out to you. I want to point out to you. First of all is their identity. They are the 12,000 uh, from each tribe of Israel. And notice that they are men. How do we know this? Because the Bible says that they are men. Now, I need to point out something to you. The Bible says that they have not been defiled with women. Uh, it doesn't mean that being married is any defilement. You can still be married and not be defiled. He's talking about their sexual purity, the fact that they are godly men, and the fact that they are volunteer celibates. Uh, the, the, nothing is forced, but because of the nature of their ministry, because of their identity and the nature of their ministry, they decided to forfeit married life in order to focus on their short time that they have to witness for Jesus Christ. That's uh, noble. That's uh, encouraging that, that they are uh, dying to self. They're, they're, they're dying for their desires for family in order to serve God. Now, 
Paul was the same way. He was a celibate. He decided, and yet he says, well, I, com I recommend that you get married. So there's nothing wrong in being married. There's nothing wrong with being with your wife is what uh, we understand from the text here. And there's nothing wrong with being celibate if that is volunteer because that's what we learn from these guys here. And Paul was the same way. Now, if somebody forces you to be celibate, that's not cool. That is not what the Bible teaches. Now, as to their identity, again, these guys are the remnant of the nation of Israel. What do I mean by that? Remember that the tribulation time is a period of judgment uh, on the earth and specifically the nation of Israel because now Paul says, in, according to Romans 11 verse 25, that there is a hardening of their hearts. In other words, they have rejected the Messiah. They have rejected Jesus Christ as their, their Messiah. And during the time that we're living now, there is a hardening of their hearts. These folks here represent the first fruits, meaning the first Jews during that time who will recognize that they missed the Messiah. And they will finally look to him on whom they, to whom they have uh, pierced, the Bible says. So these are the, 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 the people who will go into the millennium alive. Remember, a lot of people are going to die during this time. We're talking about the future tribulation here, the seven-year uh, period of tribulation. Many people are going to die. Well, not these ones. They are protected specifically by God. They're not the only ones who are going to survive everything and, and, and witness the second coming of Christ from the earth. Uh, but they are specifically 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel, and they're going to be evangelists. As, again, we're talking about their identity. They're going to minister. They're going to lead people to Christ. In fact, they're going to lead the biggest revival we have ever seen in, in history here because they're going to turn the hearts of people and point them to Christ. And again, because of the nature of their ministry and their focus, uh, they're, they're going to forfeit married life. Again, a very noble thing to do because that's what God put in, them, in their hearts. Now, if you're like me, you do not have the gift of celibacy. I need a wife to do what I can do. And, uh, and, and some of you ask me or, or tell me every Sunday morning, well, you look nice, you, 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 you suit matches with your shirt and everything. That's because of my wife. Now, if I didn't have a wife, man, I, I, I don't have the gift of matching colors. So, but again, some of us <clears throat> don't have the call, but what we learn from them here is in their godliness. So, um, let's talk about uh, their identity and also um, their position. John calls them the first fruit. That's an expression from the Old Testament. And it's uh, the reference there in Deuteronomy 18, verses 3 through 5. And it's a reference to their special and unique service to God. The first fruits were um, exclusively to the Levites. They're, 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 they're uh, set apart for, for the people of God who were serving God full time. So they're designated the same idea here, the same term as a way to identify them as a special service, as a special nature of their ministry, of their service. And keep that in mind. Again, this is in contrast to everything we saw in chapter 13, people following the Antichrist, people who are going to blaspheme God. They're going to worship the Antichrist. They're going to be Satan worshipers during the end times because they're going to fall into idolatry and sexual immorality. And, and it's so refreshing to see some people here who have not been defiled by all of these things. And they're godly folks. <clears throat> Again, uh, we see them in, uh, in fact, uh, in chapter 6 of the, uh, of the book of Revelation, uh, <clears throat> you remember some of the martyrs in heaven were crying out to God, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood and those who dwell on the earth? And then we met those who dwell on the earth in chapter uh, 13 who will be persecuting believers in Christ. And then <clears throat> later on we see uh, in chapter, verse 16 of chapter 6, The great day of the wrath of God has come. And who is able to stand? Remember that question? Who is able to stand the great day of, uh, of the wrath of God? These are the people who withstand the wrath of God because they are protected supernaturally by God. They have the mark or, or, or the seal of the Holy Spirit in contracts with the people who will have the mark of the beast who will be uh, forced to, to follow the Antichrist because they have rejected Jesus Christ. So we looked at their identity, their uh, position, 
The Bible talks about the fact that they have been purchased from the earth twice. In this passage here, we learn that they have been purchased from the earth. And who purchased them? Jesus Christ, same way he purchased people today. If you're a follower of Christ, if you're a believer in Christ, you have been purchased by the Lamb of God. You have been purchased by God. And the price was the blood of Jesus Christ. He died on a cross to purchase you from the slave market of sin. And therefore, now you are no longer a slave to sin. If you're a follower of Christ, if you're a believer in Christ, you have been purchased by Jesus Christ and you belong to God twice. One, because he made you. Second, because he redeemed you by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And now you belong to Jesus Christ. You are his property and therefore no one can touch you apart from the permission of God, apart from the permissive will of God. Now, <clears throat> believers do go through a tribulation. They, go, they, do, they do go through persecution, but that's all part of God's plan. Now, these guys here, we know very clearly what the plan for their lives uh, is because they're not going to be killed by the followers of the Antichrist because they will need to go into the tribulation period. They're preachers. They're going to preach Christ during the tribulation period, and they're going to go into the millennium, and they're going to preach also during that time because people will go into the millennium alive, and uh, kids will be born during that time, and they will need to learn about Jesus Christ. So they'll need, there will be a demand for preachers. And these guys are going to lead the way in doing that. So their identity, their position, and let's look at their godliness. Again, <clears throat> we've been talking about the purity of their hearts. They will serve God with purity of heart. They're not, they're not going to be forced into t celibacy, uh, <clears throat> but they will choose to forfeit married life or family life uh, for the sake of, of the gospel because they will understand the urgency of leading people to Christ. They, they know that they will only have a limited period of time to lead others to Christ. So they're going to focus 100% of their attention um, to following Jesus Christ. In fact, the, the image here shows us that they follow Jesus Christ wherever he goes, that they follow the Lamb, which means, church, that they really understand the high cost of discipleship. They really understand that salvation is free, but following Jesus Christ will cost you everything. It will cost you your comfort. It will cost you your popularity, and it will cost you uh, criticism and everything else. But the Bible says they will be blameless because there is no lie in their mouth. The reason for that is because they're going to be preachers. They will preach the truth of the gospel, and therefore there is no room for a lie in their mouth. Again, in contrast with the lies that we learned about um, the false prophet. Remember the second beast that we were talking about in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation? The false prophet who will deceive the whole world into following a one world religion, into following the Antichrist, following uh, uh, which really is a demonic, a satanic system of religion, probably based on works. We know it's going to be, uh, th there's going to be a lot of idolatry involved, there, there's going to be a giant image, uh, statue worship, I image, graven image worship. These are all lies. But these guys here are not going to speak any lies. The, nobody's going to be able to accuse them of hypocrisy because they are going to be blameless, above reproach. Imagine 144,000 Daniels. Remember the book of Daniel? The, how he was above reproach. People were trying to blackmail him and they couldn't find anything to accuse him of because he was a man of prayer. Same thing right here. Same thing with, imagine 144,000 Pauls. Powerful preachers of the gospel, confrontational preachers, leading people to Christ, saying, judgment is coming, you need to turn to Christ. And there's nothing that, that's going to stop them. Nobody's going to be able to accuse them into, uh, of hypocrisy or anything because they're blameless. They have pure lives. They have pure motives. They serve God with excellence and, and purity of heart. And what a great example for us. Uh, I hope you're inspired by the, the, these uh, men here, the lives of these guys. They understand the high cost of, this, of discipleship. They follow Jesus Christ wherever he goes. In fact, let's look at the lessons we learn from them right here, from the lives of these folks here, their ministry, their identity, their position, and their godliness. First of all, <clears throat> none of us here has a visible mark uh, in our bodies that uh, signify that we belong to God. That's not a, a common thing that's ha that happens in this age. It's going to be visible for the people of that future time, but 
We're all sealed with the Holy Spirit, are we not? If you're a believer in Christ, the Bible says you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 13, and also chapter 4, verse 30. Friend, if you are a believer in Christ, if you are a follower of Christ, the Holy Spirit came into you the day you decided to follow Jesus Christ, the day you, you, you came to Christ and you repented and you turned to him in faith. You may not have felt it. Um, maybe your only emotion was conviction of sin. I got emotional when I uh, became saved because I realized such a, a, a wretched sinner that I was and such a great savior that I had, and I got a little emotional. That's normal for people to be emotional when they get saved, but you don't normally feel the Holy Spirit coming into you, and that's the, uh, <clears throat> the feature of, of this time. We have the seal of God in us, which means in the spirit world, when people uh, look at us in the spiritual world, they recognize that we belong to God and we are his property. And the seal of the Holy Spirit also functions as a pledge uh, of the, the future promise that we'll have to inherit the kingdom and we'll inherit everything that God has uh, for us. In fact, that's in 2 Corinthians 1, the pledge of that promise. Now, <clears throat> God has not promised to keep us alive during a time of tribulation here uh, during this time like he did with these folks. But let me remind you that uh, he did that to the church in Philadelphia in chapter 3, verse 11. Again, representing every church that there ever was. Those seven churches, remember, they represent every church from the time of Pentecost until the day of the rapture. And in chapter 3, verse 11, he promised to uh, keep them saved from tribulation that is coming uh, uh, to the whole world. And the evidence of that is we don't hear the word church anymore since chapter 4 of the book of, Re of Revelation, the end of chapter 4. That's because the church is no longer on the earth, which means, uh, church, that we will be raptured out of here and protected from this time of tribulation. And the, the security that we have and the, the, the seal of that promise is the Holy Spirit in us. We have the seal of God. Now, second, if you belong to Christ, you have been purchased by God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And where, what were you purchased from? Listen to Paul, first, uh, first chapter of the book of Colossians, verse 13. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So if you belong to Jesus Christ, you no longer belong to the uh, kingdom of darkness. You now belong to the kingdom of his son. But as Americans, we're not too fond of kingdoms, are we? We, 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 we like republics. Right, because we, 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 200 years ago, we uh, broke away from a kingdom. Well, this is a benevolent kingdom. This is a benevolent theocracy. I mean, that's, that's a redundancy. Uh, the theocracy is benevolent if Christ is reigning. So uh, we're no longer uh, slaves to sin. If the Son has set you free, the Bible says you are free indeed. And we're no longer uh, condemned by our sin. We're no longer controlled by our sin. Did you know that? If you have been purchased by God, with the blood of Jesus Christ, one of the benefits of that is you are no longer controlled by sin, which means you are able to overcome your sin. You are able, whatever that sin is, you are able to overcome it because sin has no more power over you. Sin has no more control over you. You are no longer condemned by the power of sin. You have been set free. But the third um, example that we have from these guys here that inspire us to live godly lives is again, they encourage us to live sexually pure lives in a culture that is overly sexual. And that's what this means here, that they are, have not been defiled with women, which means they are pure. They have pure motives, pure hearts, and that we should follow the same example. Now, it doesn't mean all of us here are going to be celibates. Some of you are looking for a spouse, and I know that. In fact, I can help you find one. But you need to find a godly spouse. And like the Bible says here, if you're a believer in Christ, you need to be looking for a believer to be your spouse. Um, and um, again, we've talked about uh, uh, the, the godly man, and we talked about uh, godly husbands and wives here, and, and it comes over and over again in our studies, in our homes and everything, the, the checklist that you need to be looking for as far as spouse. Again, if you need help with that, uh, we'll help you. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> that's God's standard for his followers to live lives that are sexually pure. Which means, my friend, if you're married, your attention, your intimacy belongs to your wife alone or to your husband alone. And I know some of you men here are struggling with that because you've been looking at websites you're not supposed to look at, and you know it. And friend, let me encourage you 
to, to keep a, a, a pure life and, and, and to not look for intimacy outside of your marriage, uh, come to us and we'll help you with that if, if you're struggling with that. But follow the example of these guys here. And the same thing with um, some of my sisters here. Maybe you're looking for romance in the wrong places. Maybe, maybe you're looking uh, for somebody else to listen to your problems when you need to go to your husband. Again, we will help you with that because that's our joy to do as a church. But then you need to look. That's God's standard for you. Um, but you may say, Pastor, too late. I've already violated that principle. Well, let me encourage you with a, a passage from 1 John. 1 John 1, 9 says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Which means, church, that God is faithful and good to keep you separated from your sin. He will not, not bring it up again and he will free you from your sin if you confess your sin to him. Talking about post-conversion sins now. If you're living a life of sin, today is the day of renewal for you. It, whether that sin is sexual or not, today is the day of renewal for you and he will make you clean. In fact, the Bible says he will separate you from your sins as far as east is from the west. But you need to confess to him. And you need to confess to your wife and you need to confess to your husband as well. Humble yourself and God's going to honor you. Forgiveness and renewal are available for you today. Remember the words of Jesus to the adulterous woman, a sexually impure woman. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. So make today the, 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 the next day of the rest of your life. A life of, of purity. A life of, of, of being clean from sin. Inspired by these guys here that we see in God's family portrait. But the fourth example here is, like these guys, we must always speak the truth. Now, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> we know the truth is not a concept. Because we as believers in Christ, we have been set free by the truth. The truth is not an idea. The truth is a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. And we know that because we have been saved by him. The Bible says that he manifested himself to us. And our culture is so confused about truth. Some people say you can't find it. Other people say you must fabricate your own as long as it works for you. But we know that that's not the case because Jesus Christ himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by me. And we know that because we have been saved by that truth. And we know truth is not relative. Truth is a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. And like these guys here, we are inspired to keep speaking the truth all the time. What that means is you just saturate yourself with the life of Jesus Christ. Read about him in the Bible. We're reading about him now. We're looking at a picture of the Lamb in, in the second coming of Jesus Christ. But there are four Gospels that you can go through and read about the life of Christ. And saturate yourself with him. Read his word, meditate on his word, and take in as much as you can of his word. And, and, and before you know it, you'll be evangelized it subconsciously because the Bible says out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks so if everything that's in your heart is Jesus Christ my friend you have no trouble leading people to Christ because it's going to just naturally come out of your mouth just the way you talk about your favorite person you're going to speak about Jesus Christ and that's a good way to keep us uh, uh, like these guys here speaking the truth now <clears throat> Let me share an example with you. The, the way I, I tend to do this is I read the Gospels. I, I try to saturate myself with the life of Jesus Christ. But there's one of my favorite uh, songs there. Since we're going to talk about a soundtrack here in this picture in a few moments, let me share with you the lyrics of my favorite song. Since we're not able to learn the song that we heard from heaven here, I'm going to teach you one. Okay, I'm not going to sing here because I don't want to empty the place. But I'm just going to give you the lyrics. Okay, this, remember, we're looking about a, a new song because it has melody and it has instrumentation. Let me just sing you the, not sing you, let me just share with you the lyrics of my favorite worship song. And it's all about Jesus Christ. Every time, every time I feel like my heart is going somewhere else, I, my, my mind is focused on uh, somebody else or someone else other than Jesus Christ, I, I, I try to sing my favorite song here. Here it is. And it's talking about my favorite treasure here my, my most treasured possession jesus christ oh lord my rock and my redeemer greatest treasure of my longing soul true delight is found in you alone your grace a well too deep to fathom your love exceeds the heaven's reach your truth a fount of perfect wisdom my highest good and my unending need strong defender of my weary heart my sword to fight the cruel deceiver in my shield against his hateful darts 
My song when enemies surround me, my hope when tides of sorrow rise, my joy when trials are abounding, your faithfulness, my refuge in the night. Now that's a good way to keep reminding yourself of Jesus Christ and, and your most treasured possession here, the Lamb of God standing tall, upright, ready to uh, take possession of the world when trials are abounding. When you feel that the hateful darts of the enemy uh, aiming at you, if you have a favorite worship song, and I hope it's all about Jesus Christ, and I encourage you to listen to it all the time. Speaking of songs, let's uh, talk about the soundtrack of this uh, uh, image here because we, we looked at the, song, the, 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 the sun, the servants, and the picture here has a soundtrack. And by the way, that's, um, that's a very good technique. That's the reason you and I cry when we look at an, a, a, a PowerPoint presentation of our favorite person with, with soundtracks because it touches our emotions. And, and, and God in his perfect wisdom here caused us to, to, to in the book of Revelation here, to be uh, touched with every sense. Uh, so there, there's a, we're looking at an image here. We're, we're listening to a song here, even though we don't know the lyrics. Um, the soundtrack is a, the, the family portrait, and it has a musical part. Now, another detail here. John has heard many thunderous voices in the book of Revelation, and he will continue to hear thunderous voices of judgment. Now he hears thunderous voices of joy. And notice here that he's talking about the fact that these, the, the, the song here, the soundtrack sounds like uh, a sounds of many waters and, and thunder. And he's talking about harps. Now, I didn't know that. I didn't know that harps sound like that. They're louder than electric guitars in heaven. It's like a rock concert. Now, we think of harps. We're talking about lyres here, L-Y-R-E. These are the word for, for that John is describing here are lyres, a small harp that, you know, people say, well, we're talking about heaven. Unbelievers normally say this, <coughs> I don't want to go to heaven because I don't want to be plucking in a harp for, forever and ever, you know, standing on a cloud. Uh, we're talking about a lyre. But nothing could be further from the truth. There's nothing boring about heaven. There's nothing, no, nothing quiet about heaven either. There's no uh, still voice in heaven. Everything is loud. Everything is celebration here. And, and again, this is louder than electric guitars. I mean, and again, this was news to me. I didn't know that harps sound like tsunamis in heaven. Because he's saying that they sound like many waters. And we, even though we don't know the lyrics of the song, uh, because we're not going to learn the song, it's another interesting aspect of the book of Revelation here. Again, a concealment of information from a book that promises to reveal. Uh, we're not told uh, what the song is. Uh, John says no one could learn the song except these guys, but we're going to see that being performed. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to witness the second coming of Christ sideways because we're going to come with Jesus Christ during, uh, on that day and we're going to uh, reign with him and we're going to see them perform this song, even though we don't know the lyrics now. <laughs> But we know the theme of the song. The theme is obviously victory, triumph, victory over persecution, uh, the kingdom of God being established here, fulfillment of divine promise. And we will hear the song here. And again, if you delight yourself in the Lord, church, uh, and even though we don't know the lyrics of the song here, he will give you the desires of your heart. The Bible says that very clearly. He will do that by changing the motivation of your heart. He's done it to me several times. Did I share this w uh, with you guys here? Many, many times I ask God to change a particular situation only to find that the situation hasn't changed after months of prayer. Only my heart about the situation has changed. And that's, uh, that's what we see here uh, with these guys and with the song here that we don't know the, the song. We're talking about triumph. If you have been struggling with something, if you find yourself in a period of trial uh, and you've, you, 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 you're going through a divine appointed time of, uh, of trial or, or, or tragedy, I encourage you to think about this image here, this picture, and delight yourself in the Lord. Because he knows uh, what you're going through. He knows the desires of your heart. And he's, gonna, he's ready to grant you the desires of your heart if they align with his desires. Is what we learn here from this whole picture. And I hope that you're encouraged to follow these guys in the godliness here. And adjust your life accordingly. Is there something that you can learn from these folks here? Even though uh, they, they are from a different time in the future. Um, they provide a great example for us of God's faithfulness. Of God's 
um, promise keeping abilities and also divine kindness because remember this is going to happen during a time of judgment and we see here that God is uh, raising up a group of people to preach the gospel why because he desires that none should perish and that's very clear in the in the New Testament, 2 Peter 3, 9, he is willing that none should perish. And, the re and he does that by raising up people to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. He doesn't desire that you should perish. So if you have not yet given your heart to the Lord, today is the day to do that. If you do not know where you're going when you die, we have the answer. Because the answer is from the Bible. And the Bible says that if you turn from your sins and you turn to Jesus Christ, he will save you today. He will make you a new person. He will change the desires of your heart. He will change you from the inside out. It's going to take time, but he will begin a good work in you, and he will carry on that good work until the day of Jesus Christ. And he's going to change your desires. You're going to start looking forward to the second coming of Christ, something you didn't even know uh, existed or something you didn't care about. Now, this photograph here in text format moves us emotionally because that's by divine design. The, 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 we're reading about terrible events that are going to happen in the future. Beasts, dragons, you know, all symbolic of satanic worship in the future and divine judgment. And the next uh, uh, sequence of events here in chapter 15, or starting in chapter 16, is a sequence of rapid-fire judgments, the bold judgments of God, seven of them. So this is God's way of preparing us for that, by giving us a moment to breathe, a pause, and point to this portrayal and say, this is my son. I want you to look at him standing tall, Jesus Christ, ready to conquer uh, the earth and ready to take what belongs to him, that the usurper has been uh, in control uh, under the authority of God for far too long. And it's time now, according to this, uh, the timetable here in the book of Revelation. But again, we're going to see everything in, in, in movie format, if you will, in chapter 19, when we see Jesus Christ coming down to touch down here on the earth. It's, gonna, it's a sequel to that. But again, keep in mind, this is not in chronological order, but the main message of, of this picture that we see here, the portrait, uh, God's family portrait here, is God's faithfulness, God's uh, kindness to people and raising up people to be witnesses of him during a time of terrible judgment on the earth and God's desire that we live godly lives and we can learn a lot from these guys here specifically in the area of sexual purity friend if you've been struggling with that you need to look uh, you need to find someone that you trust and talk to them about that uh, we live in a, in a society here that is so uh, godless in terms of, of, of sexual purity so young people I want you to talk to someone about this if you're struggling with this because God wants you to be pure God the, and I want you to be inspired by this which means that you need to wait until marriage in order to be intimate with someone because that's God's standard for you that's in the Bible and we will help you with that and 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 God knows what he's talking about he's it's not a cosmic killjoy his desire is not for you to just not enjoy life but he wants you to enjoy life in the right context and friends any of you here are married and you're struggling with sexual purity, you need to talk to someone. That's what we're here for. The church exists for that. We carry each other's burden. But you need to confess to the Lord. You need to confess to your wife or to your husband and, 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 and trust that God will clean your heart and uh, will cleanse your motivations because he's more interested in your godliness than you are and he's ready to help you and we're ready, ready to help you as well but mo first things first if you're not a believer in Christ make sure you come and talk to us and say I'm ready to give my heart to, my heart to Jesus Christ and um, I'll, I'll, it's our great joy to do that to lead people to Christ now join me in prayer Father thank you for today Thank you for the opportunity we have, Lord, to uh, open the Word of God and study what you have to say by what you have already said in your Word, Lord. And your Word is so precious, Lord, and it's so relevant to us, Lord. It's more relevant than today's newspaper, Lord, talking about all of these things, like godliness, uh, talking about the kindness of God and uh, the holiness of God and the faithfulness of God, Lord. Father, I pray that we will meditate on these truths today, Lord, and we will adjust our lives accordingly. We'll adjust our lives, Lord, if, uh, wherever they need to be adjusted. Lord, if there's sin that needs to be confessed, Lord, I pray that you will uh, equip us to do that and, and, and ask forgiveness if we need to ask forgiveness to our wife or to our husbands, Lord, or to anybody else. 
Lord. But we do need to live lives that are going to be honoring to you like these 144,000 here that we read about in the book of Revelation, Lord. We recognize that they're from a different time. They're in the future, that they are yet to be born, Lord. But their example here, you have recorded their example even before they were even born, Lord, so that we can look forward to godliness, to, to the standard that you expect from us, Lord, because uh, we want to honor you in everything we do, Lord. And I pray that Grace Baptist Church will be just like these folks, Lord. Maybe we're not 144,000. We're 250 strong, Lord. But I pray, Father, that each one of us here will live a sexually pure lives, Lord, lives that are going to be honoring to you, Lord, and lives that are going to be like these guys, first fruits because of our excellent service to you, Lord. And that's how we want to reach our community for Christ. We want to, like these guys, be witnesses of Christ, faithful witnesses of Christ, Lord, and, and announce that there is no salvation in any other name except the name of Jesus Christ because we know the truth, because we have been set free by the truth, and we know that the truth is not a concept but is a person, and his name is Jesus Christ, and we love to talk about him and we love to sing about him we pray these things in jesus name amen <laughs>